So welcome to the show. Today I'm with Jan. Jan, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. My name is Jan Trey. I'm a I guess I'm in a long time AWS user, and I've also been an AWS serverless hero since 2018. Um, so I yeah, do a bunch of different things uh, to help other people to adopt serverless. I work as an independent consultant to help other companies, uh, but also work with uh, the team at the Lumigo to help them uh, improve the serverless observability space, uh, helping them with uh, some of the content side of things, webinars and things like that. Um, and in general, you can find me on the burningmonk.com. You can also find me on social media, uh, on LinkedIn and uh, Twitter as well. Yeah. So you have a consultancy company called The Burning Monk, which you help provide guidance and technical support to companies That's in right, terms yep. of, let's say, cost saving or achieving technical requirements. But you also provide workshops and trainings as well. What made you consider the path of creating a consultancy company? Yeah, in some ways, it feels like uh, my career was always kind of heading towards that. Uh, you know, I, uh, I've been pre you know, previous to going into consultancy myself. Um, I spent a lot of time just advising other people, uh, not as a paid job, but it's just uh, something that uh, people ask me as uh, I've been sharing a lot of the things I've learned in public and uh, conferences, uh, you know, speaking there. I've been blogging for, I guess, a long time now as well, uh, since about 2000, well, well, it feels like 15 years, maybe more. Um, but yeah, just through my you know, sharing my experience in the public, uh, a lot of people have uh, come to me for advice and help. So in some ways, I've been kind of uh, uh, consulting, just uh, not as a, not as a job uh, for a long time. Uh, and uh, you know, as a move, uh, you know, from more of a hands-on role to principles, and uh, you know, doing more of the um, so solving problems uh, for for businesses as opposed to just uh, heads down to writing code. Um, I also find myself uh, more and more being kind of uh, you know, pushed into that role where I have to think understand, you know, think about more the on the business uh, uh, in impact and not just on okay how much how elegant you know, uh, how how elegant my code is and uh, um, and so thinking a bit the bigger uh, maybe outside of uh, okay, not just uh, what we do but also why we do it and how to best do it and thinking about the uh, organization structures and how to make teams. Uh, work better together, uh, looking at the friction points and uh, where businesses uh, need help. So in a way, I guess uh, my career kind of just moving sort of towards that uh, uh, naturally as, uh, as my career uh, progressed. Um, and yeah, so 2019, I decided to just uh, take the plunge, be thinking about it for some time and decided to, you know what, let's just do it. Uh, luckily, I was able to, well, no, I, I was working at the zone at the time. And uh, as I was going, you know, deciding to take this plunge, um, they, just, they, you know, they were happy to keep me on for half time. So I was able to, you know, kind of go into a part time so that I've still got this full time, well, not, not full time, but the part time job. It's got a salary in case uh, something doesn't quite work out. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I did that for about six months and then, uh, yeah, it seems, feels like it's something that I want to do. Um, and, uh, it was, uh, yeah, I know I was able to find work through my, all my sort of public, uh, um, content, people finding out that, uh, I'm available to consult. And so they come to me, uh, I've not had to do any sort of outbound, uh, uh, code emailing or things like that. Uh, it's all been based on the, the stuff that I've been put out there over the years. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, um. Yeah, it's something that I feel like uh, I have really enjoyed doing the last couple of years. Um, it's not always, uh, no, not everything is uh, is good, but, uh, you know, most of it is good, I think. Yeah, the consultancy life is a bit difficult if we want to talk about it. It's not easy. Yeah, it's not easy. You it's have to um, go through all. It's uh, you, know, you know, when you're uh, when you're an employee, you're an engineer, you each have one job. Um well, maybe multiple jobs, but multiple hats you wear at least. Uh, but when you are a small business owner, in, uh, independent consultant, uh, you have uh, to wear many more hats. Uh, you know, you are your own uh, CEO, you are your own financial chief financial officer, you are your own uh, chief operating officer, marketing officer. Uh, you have to do everything yourself, uh, everything from just managing your finances to um you know, finding clients to actually doing the work itself um to invoicing billing uh, marketing uh still while still producing uh, producing content there's just a lot more a lot more responsibilities uh you know finding taxes and uh, uh vat returns uh, all these things there's just a lot of different uh, hats you have to wear 
um, as both a software engineer, but also as um, as a business owner. Um, and also, I mean, the, the, we can talk about a lot of good because the, you know, on the good side of things, uh, you know, you get exposed to so many different things uh, in a very short space of time. You can essentially accumulate, if you think about, uh, you know, working uh, and uh, having a career as a way to, you know, sort of video game terms, uh, you do actions, you get you know, experience points and over time you level up. Um, think about, uh, you know, consulting is that uh, you get a lot of different experiences um, uh, very, very quickly. I mean, the, if you, you know, I guess as a, as a, as a, as a, as a um, as a developer, you, you know, solve the same problem 10 times. The first time you do it, uh, it feels very fresh. You learn something new. But then the, the second, third, fourth, and you know, tenth time you do some, the same thing, you, you don't get the same level of learning. You kind of have to expose yourself to different problems, different settings, different contexts. Um, and uh, as a consultant, you may see the same problem, but um, because the client is different, the client has different constraints, different contexts. Maybe they are small startup. Uh, maybe another client has similar problem, but they are now an enterprise with 10,000 employees. So the way you think about a problem in, in the context of the client is very different. So it really helps broaden your perspective on how you look at problems and how you also solution architect or the uh, problem solve. Um, so from that perspective, you learn a lot of different things uh, very, very quickly. Uh, you can probably get 10 years worth of, uh, I guess, exposure to different ideas and the context and problems and dimensions to the problems uh, within, the, you know, within a matter of months or even just uh, one or two years. So it's a, it's a great way to accelerate your learning and development. Um, and, uh, uh, but on the downside of things, uh, one of the biggest things, apart from just the fact that you have a lot more responsibilities is that, uh, it can get lonely because uh, I work on my own. Um, sometimes on a project, I may bring in uh, a friend as a subcontractor to help me you know, get some more bandwidth on a project. Uh, but by and large, I work on my own. So, you, you know, you do miss that uh, team chemistry, working with people and, uh, forming that, uh, almost like, uh, um, you know, uh, team spirit, <laughs> uh, you know, working with other people and really developing that relationship. Um, you still develop relationships with your clients, but it's not as deep as, uh, you know, working with someone who is you not know, side by side, uh, uh, for years. Um, but yeah, that's probably the, for me, the, the, you know, the biggest, uh, so, you know, good and bad, uh, good is that there's a lot of learning. Uh, the bad is that uh, you can get lonely sometimes. And there's also a lot of uh, responsibilities uh, besides just, uh, engineering. I feel like when you work in a company, you just hit a specific plateau where that's it. Like you're not going to go beyond what the company has to provide to you. Like you move on specific use cases, but there's not going to be that much different use cases by time. Whereas when you work as a consultant, things are just a little bit different. It can be, it can be. I mean, when you're working for a company, um, depends on the size of this and the scale of the company, of course, uh, you can hit a plateau uh, at some point in your in your current role, but you can, you know, in larger companies, there's always the possibility to move to a different you know, area of the business uh, or to take on a slightly different role and that will give you fresh challenges. And I think that's a really healthy thing um, to be able to, you know, to to constantly challenge yourself and to learn something new. Um, it can be very st uh, stressing, but uh, stressful, but uh, um, I think uh, you know, some amount of stress uh, is, is not a bad thing, especially if uh, you, you know, especially if you, you don't take on too much of it uh, and only do what you're able to stretch yourself to. Um, Certainly at, uh, I guess, the large companies like uh, Amazon or Microsoft, there's so many different areas of business, so many different challenges. Uh, you can quite easily move around and still find new and the fresh challenges all the time. Uh, but again, in those large companies, there's uh, probably a lot more corporate um, politics that you have to deal with as well, which is, again, is the downside. And that's something that I really enjoy working you know, small, in small startups where you kind of you can do everything um, that you kind of you, know, you want to put your hands on. Um, then there's not so much uh, you know, human politics uh, to deal with. Uh, but yeah, as a consultant, you do find yourself uh, finding a lot of uh, fresh con you know, fresh problems that you, you, know, you have to basically you know, constantly uh, hopping between jobs to be able to find the same level of challenge. Uh, but at the same time, you're not as, deep, uh, as deeply ingrained to those problems as you would be if you are the person who have to implement everything, have to support everything. So 
um, and, uh, no, the ability to, I guess, emphasize with the client, understand um, problems that you may not have encountered before, and think in their shoes is this really important part. And uh, probably the, I guess, the most important part of being a consultant is just, uh, I guess, being likable, um, someone who, you know, who, so who people who want to work with. Uh, that's that's probably the, probably the most important thing you can do as a consultant. Um, to be uh, to be able to emphasize with your clients the problems in the context and uh, yeah provide solutions that uh, um, that works for them and not just you know, for you. When will one building, let's say, a consultancy company, it requires a certain level of credibility to gain people's trust. So one of them is like publishing content, which you've been publishing blogs for you said around fifteen years. Another way, let's say, is publishing concrete content like books or courses or giving trainings. As someone who did launch a book and gave a course with respectable publishers, which is Manning Publishing and O'Reilly Media, along with hosting your own courses and trainings, what is the challenge of being, let's say, self-published or going towards a publishing company? When to consider which? What are the things that are available in this option that's not available in that other option? And if you want to talk about the experience of, let's say, launching a book versus launching a course or doing a workshop. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, I guess there's quite a few questions uh, there. Let me see if I can remember all of them. Um, so I guess the, the first thing, you know, publishing, uh, say, like a book or a course, a video course with a, a well-known publisher like Manning or O'Reilly or uh, whoever, um, let me see that they're going to bring a lot of the sort of credibility and authority. Um, so if you don't have that online presence already, um, so that can be a really good way to build authority in the field. Um, I guess that the, the, the main downside is that uh, it's really hard to make an actual living uh, selling um, books or courses uh, through a publisher like that because uh, they take most of the, the revenue. Um, I think for books, you probably get... A single digit percentage, maybe three, four percent, is, uh, is for the industry average um, to of your actual revenue from the sale of the books. Uh, which you may think, okay, I'm doing all the work here, guys. Um, but at the same time, the publisher has got, is doing all the marketing, is uh, doing all the um, printing, and paying all the fees for platforms and things like that. Um, so you know, in a way, I can understand. Also, um, with uh, working with a publisher, they provide a lot of. Uh, editorial support which can be good and can you know, can be really beneficial especially if you've never done um, like a, a book or like a, a, a structured course uh, before um, so to us to get some of that uh, experience and uh, and feedback I think it can be very helpful uh, Manning for example they also organize uh, several rounds of uh, peer reviews uh, as part of the process of writing a book or as part of you know, putting together a video course, they, they organize and find uh, uh, candidates to you know review your book uh, while you're still writing it. Uh, but it's up to you to then decide what you know, feedback you take. And those feedback is, is also often hit and miss. It's, um, it's difficult to oftentimes uh, derive uh, really meaningful feedback from some uh, from some of those uh, review sessions I found. Um, the the main upside for um, for self publishing is that uh, um, oh so another downside for working with an editor is uh, with a editorial team from say a publisher is that sometimes they have their own sort of roadmap of what they want to cover uh, that's outside of your book. Uh, for example, a publisher may say, well, you know, we've got all of these other books around the same topic of AWS. Uh, you know, we want you to write a book about this thing, and you may have an idea that uh, kind of that goes beyond what you, you know what the initial scope is. But they may say that, uh, oh, but we got other books for that already, um, and we don't want to kind of uh, you know overstep uh, the boundary of what we want you to do for this book. So you have to, you don't have as much editorial control and the creative freedom as you would do if you were to um, self-publish. Um, the main upside to self-publish is that, uh, well, you keep all of the revenue minus whatever platform costs you have. Um, so you can actually make a decent uh, uh, living off of, uh, you know, a while selling book or course or whatever. And we've seen you know, many people in the last couple of years, and more and more so, in fact, uh, the self-publishing books and courses and using social media as a marketing platform as opposed to um, the more traditional publishers. Um, Many of whom have to say don't do maybe quite as good a job as uh, I've seen individuals do uh, on social media in terms of uh, promotion and building up that uh, um, uh, the, I guess the, the marketing for their uh, for their books and courses. Um, 
that yeah that's the main upside the downside is that the, you know again it became a more lonely uh sort of experience of writing a book and you don't have people pushing you nudging you to uh, to stick to some form of deadline uh it requires much more discipline and uh and I've I've seen I've, I've known guys who's um, uh, who's you know, started to write a book and uh, years later still haven't finished because maybe they just don't have that uh, that push um, from a from a publisher saying um, we agreed on a deadline for this thing <laughs> I know you're a bit late uh, but please um, you know do some work and to, uh, and to get it ready so again yeah self self publishing and then you are responsible for all the marketing so you know the success and failure is entirely on you uh, there's no one else to blame which can be good but it can also again uh, be a lonely experience um and uh, there's also there's lots of different platforms lots of things to consider so besides writing your book and or and or you know, marketing again you have to wear many different hats um Again, it's something that uh, I have to learn a lot about, uh, you know, writing book, uh, self-publishing books and the courses. And uh, in terms of, I think your second part of your question was the difference between the video course and the workshop. So I, I've got a couple of uh, self-published video courses, um, uh, but I also run a workshop uh, called the Production Ready Serverless. Um, the main difference is uh, really just about uh, the learning experience. Um, because one of the things, I mean, most of what you want to learn, you can just go on the internet and to find you know, information and read them or watch them on YouTube. There's a lot of content available for free nowadays. Um, so the question always uh, comes on, comes to mind is, uh, okay, what value am I bringing with this uh, course? Uh, you know, why should someone pay money to con you know, consume my course uh, uh, rather than just uh, go to bunch of different uh, online sources and probably find something similar that uh, I've already shared myself because I've been writing stuff and sharing stuff in public for so long. Um, always comes back to the thing that always comes back to is, uh, well, if you're learning and reading stuff on YouTube uh, or Medium on you know, random blogs uh, on the internet, then the, you are, you know, there's no structure there. You have to consume information, work out what's relevant for you and what's not, uh, and then the, trying to make sense of different ideas and uh, advice that different people are offering and figure out, okay, most of the time people when when they, when they share this advice uh, they don't provide the full context uh, you know an idea may be great for an enterprise but can be a terrible idea for a staff for example um, and so you kind of you as a reader oftentimes have to kind of just um, work out what's the context uh, you know where that advice came from and uh, whether or not it applies to you so the the i guess the value add of a course and that's why i still do them and uh, still people still come to my courses and workshops is that uh, you can provide a structure uh, you can you know rather than lots of different fragments that uh, you provide a complete picture um, and so and also um, you, you're giving one um, one set of coherent ideas and advice that works together as opposed to 100 different uh, uh, you know ideas that maybe don't work with each other uh, and the workshop is uh, then provides another sort of layer of value add is uh, okay a video course is hard to get the feedback from the author and to you know ask ask questions because again you know, nobody can give you an answer that's going to fit for everybody uh, as uh, as someone who gives advice uh, professionally uh, you know I I, can, I do my best to you know to give general advice that should apply to most people um, but you no, know, everyone has got their the unique uh, you know, sl 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 tweak uh, in the in in the way maybe the the the, the, the organization that works or maybe the way they prefer to uh, to work with uh, different technologies because of constraints they have on tooling or whatnot. Uh, so, you no, know, the ability to actually have access to the the the, the author and ask questions and uh, get uh, live feedback and have that conversation. I think that's where the workshop format, and that's why I stick. I'm still sticking with the this cohort based workshop format for production ready serverless, so that uh, you know people from different walks of life can uh, take this workshop together within a four weeks period, and that uh, they can ask questions, and uh, I can answer those questions, but other people can also chip in as well. Maybe someone with a different perspective. 
And I think uh, uh, I think that's where you can add additional value um, through a workshop, is through that engagement, that the interactivity uh, versus the on-demand video course, which again is just someone consuming ideas in a more structured format than they would if they were to watch hundred different YouTube videos. And that structure really helps in terms of your learning uh, and uh, that, that engagement, that interaction with um, the, the author, again, is how you can then fine tune some of those ideas and see and how to get and get them and understand how to apply them to your specific uh, um, situation. And there's also the, the thing is that workshops feel more natural and more time constrained. So if I want to learn, let's say, about a topic and I want to go on a workshop in four weeks, I've learned about this topic. The possibility of, let's say, on on demand, I might throw it off to like one month, two months, and I won't even read the entire content entirely. Yeah, that's that's true as well. Um, no, uh, we don't have perfect recall. Uh, no, human memory is, is a flawed uh, uh, mechanism. Um, so the longer you kind of you know you have gaps in your actual learning, that the more likely that uh, something you know you've learned along the way that's increased that's that's crucial for learning the next thing. Uh, we just have fallen out of your head. Um, so having some time constraint uh, is definitely a, a good thing as far as the learning is, uh, is concerned. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, life um, has got constraints. Uh, you know, not everyone is able to dedicate, uh, 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 give up, give up uh, you know, five, 10 hours per week to do, to, to do everything that's, uh, that I have in the workshop. And I have lots of students who you know, sign up to the workshop, but never actually start until we even finish the whole workshop. Um, so the content's still available for them, but they kind of miss out on that interaction that uh, you know, being able to ask questions live to me and uh, get, you know, get um, tailored uh, answer and feedback uh, for you know, whatever it is that they are doing. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, that's just the you know that's just the the, the reality of it that uh, everyone has got other things outside of uh, uh, what they're doing, and that's where the, the, there's still a lot of value for on-demand uh, uh, video courses, and there's a lot of demand for that because the people have got other things uh, in, going on in their lives, and that they can't always dedicate um, um, dedicate the, the amount of time they need to sort of stick to the workshop format. I'm going to move to a different question, which is as someone who worked in different settings, you've worked with regulated institutions like a bank and regular companies. What is the experience working between these two? Like what's the experience between working, let's say, in a regulated institution versus, let's say, a regular company? Yeah, the, there's just a, a lot of uh, additional things you have to so sort of, you know, worry about. Um, you know, if you're a startup, uh, but you know, and you're not in a regulated environment, then the, you know, pretty much anything goes. Uh, there's a lot less uh, restrictions in terms of uh, what services you can use, um, you know, what tools you can use, uh, who can access what. There's still some basic things you have to worry about uh, because of the uh, you know, uh, regulatory requirements uh, that applies to much broader. Than, the, than a specific industry, things like GDPR and things like that. Um, but when you're in a regulated industry, then the, there's just a lot, much more scrutiny and much more risk uh, involved uh, with uh, uh, compliance. And so there's more people involved in the whole process as well. Um, so anything you, that you're doing may have to be um, signed off by InfoSec, which have got specific requirements that's aligned with uh, the industry regulation. Um, for example, in any sort of enterprise environment, uh, VPC is uh, practically a mandatory requirement for any Lambda functions that uh, probably doesn't really need it uh, outside of, uh, okay, um, some regulatory requirement about um, data access control. Um, and you know, the upside is that, uh, well, you know, you should make things better, uh, but a lot of oftentimes I find that uh, uh, it can also just become a you know, ticking box exercise of ticking boxes and uh, we are not doing. We, we you know we're not we're not seeing the full value of uh, of of uh, say adding VPCs uh, uh, because we're not adding you know, proper egress control and that's you know, that's such a simple example. But uh, but yeah, the, it it in terms of uh, what that uh, what it means to you as a developer uh, or engineer is uh, well things just take longer. Everything has more people to approve. Uh, there's more things uh, to have to be done uh, for every solution. There's ways to kind of you know, make that boilerplate and um, repeatable, but uh, still that's just additional things that you have to, additional requirements you have to take off every single time. Um, and yeah, more people in the chain of uh, something being done and deployed to production. 
Um, but yes, it's it's unfortunate. It's uh, something that, that you just have to do because uh, that's the uh, re- that's you know, that's what means what it means to be inside a, a regulated uh, environment. And also the the thing is that learning new things and adopting new things is just much harder than just doing it in a regular company. So if you will, let's say we want to use a new service or I want to use a new technology, you you do have to convince them. And it's just very difficult to convince a set of people in a regular environment to change something. Yeah, yeah. Because of the risk of uh, non-compliance and the penalties that were not involved, uh, people are less are more risk um, averse when it comes to choosing new technologies or adopting new technologies or new tools. Uh, you know, unless it's uh, unless they've got the right um, uh, compliance themselves, um, and also it's just the the risk of unknown is much more of a uh, much more of a you know force uh, in that decision process, um, or rather um, friction in that decision process. Yeah, that that's for sure. Yeah, but when working with different companies, you get introduced to different use cases, ideas, methodologies, and services, and new patterns of development, which is one of the things that you've adopted is developing on serverless. Can you explain what serverless for those who might not be familiar with it and how you got into serverless? Yeah, sure. Uh, when we talk about uh, serverless, uh, my loose definition is that uh, you know, anything can be considered the serverless uh, if it um, means that you don't have to manage the underlying infrastructure, which are the servers. So things like uh, you don't have to you know, patch the underlying servers, you don't have to um, set up machine images, you don't have to choose how many instances you have to run, uh, you don't have to worry about the scaling. You know, when does it? Uh, when do you have to scale out to two instances, three instances, what not? All of those are managed by the under by the service provider. Um, another thing is that uh, you should have uh, pay per use pricing so that uh, you only uh, pay for that service so when you do use them. Um, so if you have, say, you know, a service that charges you based on uh, the fact that uh, even if no one's using your system, but you still have to pay for it because, uh, for example, for EC2 instances or for RDS, then that, that's not very serverless because you're paying for uptime and not for usage. Another thing is that the last one is that uh, you should have um, the ability to scale to zero, uh, which again uh, ties into that uh, the cost of um, the, it's kind of similar to the usage cost, uh, but it's important for a very common practice uh, in the service development is to use a temporary or ephemeral environment so that um, when I'm say starting a new feature, I can uh, create my feature branch. I can uh, create my entire uh, create um, an environment for my application, like a clone of the whole application um, in my one of my AWS accounts, and I can uh, create a whole new you know, stack with my API gateway, Lambda, DynamDB, whatnot. So entire clone of say a, a, a microservice I'm working on. Um, and I can have many, many of these things uh, and uh, only pay for them when I actually run some workload against that uh, API that I've deployed. So there's no actual cost overhead for having lots of these environments. And uh, one nice thing is that uh, you know, with this, I don't have to worry about uh, stepping on other people's toes as they work on other f- features in parallel because we all have our dedicated uh, uh, environments that we can work and uh, iterate and uh, test against without worrying about uh, it's going to impact other people. And those environments are short-lived. So when I'm finished my, with my feature, hopefully within a couple of hours or a day or so, um, I can delete my branch and delete the environment. So if you just, you no know, poof, you'd be gone. Um, and again, we only pay for them uh, when we actually say running tests against our APIs in the end-to-end tests, uh, or when we, you know, doing doing some manual testing and whatnot. So there's no cost overhead to say, oh, if we have to pay for 10 different RDS clusters, because every time you create a new environment is a new RDS cluster. Um, so you know, that is something that that's going to stop you from uh, you know, applying this, uh, this, 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 this practice of using temporary environments. So my loose definition would be just those, those three characteristics and that can describe any services like you know, S3, DynamDB, SNS, SQS, EventBridge, Lambda functions, API gateway, and so on. Uh, of course, it's not always, uh, not, not, not every service is going to submit all of those uh, things nicely, things like um, Kinesis, for example, there's you no know, still paying for uptime, but it's kind of serverless. So uh, many people will describe serverless more of a, 
uh, more of a, a spectrum so that on the one end you've got services that are you know, fully serverless, like S3, SNS, DynamDB, Lambda, and so on. But on the other end, you have things that are definitely not serverless, things like EC2, these uh, things like... Um, yeah, easy to and things like that. Um, and then the, somewhere made in the middle, you've got things like Kinesis, which takes most of the boxes, uh, but still have that pay for uptime. Um, even uh, And then you've got things like uh, Fargate, which uh, um, is kind of people call it serverless containers uh, because it eliminates some of the under uh, management of the underlying EC2 instances that have that's gonna that, you, um, that you're gonna use to run your uh, container workload. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, you know, happy with that definition as well. Um, I believe like um, serverless is becoming more like it's managed for you rather than just saying, let's say serverless as like there's no underlying service. So you start to see like, I say, don't think you ever that meant that there's no underlying server because that is never a thing. Um, and uh, you shouldn't equate that. And uh, I mean, every, for a long time, every time I say serverless, someone reminds me that uh, there are still servers, uh, but that's not the point, right? Because uh, Wi-Fi is still, Wi-Fi or wireless, uh, it still has got wires. It's just not wires that you need to worry about. Um, there's still cables and connecting to the routers. It's just that when you're using a Wi-Fi connection, those cables is not something that you got to worry about. So to say serverless uh, means there's no server, that's just not the case. No one ever said that to begin with. Um, and the serverless just means that those servers are not your responsibility to manage and, uh, and provision and, uh, and configure. It doesn't mean that they don't exist. And the fact that they exist is, you know, is irrelevant. Yeah. But what is the core benefits of adopting serverless for, let's say, a business or developer, other than, let's say, uh, cutting costs, uh, since I'm not going to be using this workload only when it's being used? Yeah, cost uh, is, uh, is is relative. Uh, depends on your throughput. So if you've got a system that's very really high throughput, then the you know paying per uh, paying per usage uh, is going to be you know work out more expensive because there's more usage. Um, way to think about this could be you know the the I guess I know I guess you said apart from cost, uh, maybe I can you know, let me cover the cost a little bit as well because that comes up a lot. Um, you know if you've got um, I guess the difference between the owning a car and the renting a car. Uh, when you own a car, there's a lot more additional cost apart from just you know, having a car. Even when you don't use it, there's still the you know, various uh, taxes and the insurance and all these other things. You still have to pay for them, even if you don't actually drive your car every single day. So the ownership of that car has a certain cost regardless of your usage. But if you drive your car every day, hours at a time, uh, then the, that that cost gets amortized, so that uh, you know, per mileage, you know, usage of your car could be actually quite low. Uh, versus uh, if we were to tax, take a taxi, um, and uh, you know the the per mileage cost uh, of your of your of, of your journeys will be really high compared to owning a car. But you know you don't pay for road tax, you don't pay for all these insurance things related to owning the uh, the, the taxi because well you know this is not your responsibility. So if you don't so you need to drive very often. Um, then the having a tax, uh, you know, taking a taxi or or, or, or Uber or whatever, uh, is just much gonna be, be much cheaper. Um, and so that's the one side of it is uh, you know cost is relative to your actual usage level. Uh, but the other side of it is just a convenience because okay, your car can break down. You need to get tires replaced. You need to get all of these other things replaced. So there's also you know, additional responsibilities apart from cost that you have to take on, and that often means uh, you need to have expertise. And uh, if you have the right expertise, maybe you're like a car geek and uh, you know how to do things, then uh, great. Otherwise, you have to go out and hire people. So again, um, to help you, you know, fix your car and whatnot, again, that raises your total cost of ownership of that car versus if I just get an Uber, um, that car breaks down. Uh, okay, sorry for that driver, but I can just get a, a new driver, get a new ride. Um, again, I don't need to have that expertise. It's much more convenient. So in many ways for business, uh, it also means that uh, the same sort of dynamic can play out in that, uh, well, you know, I, if I was to run a containerized workload, uh, you know, even if, um, say, uh, you know, we, we have a certain amount of traffic, so it'd be cheaper to run everything on containers. Um, the question then as a business becomes, okay, in terms of total cost of ownership, 
how many people do I need to say run a Kubernetes cluster? Probably need a whole team of people to look after that Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes environment because of all the complexities around the, you know, securing it properly and also making it so that it's uh, highly redundant and scalable. And also if something goes wrong, I need to have someone who can fix it and bring it back online. I can't have my application down for hours just because uh, no one in the team knows how to fix uh, uh, a Kubernetes in, uh, cluster, right? So again, all of those costs goes towards my my underlying um, cost for my application. Um, as a developer, we may not even think about that, but as a business, we need to look at the total cost of ownership uh, versus uh, using a managed service uh, like Lambda and API Gateway. Then, okay, well, you know, if something goes on, then the Amazon is the one that's um, to provide the expertise and engineers to fix the issue with the underlying service. So we don't have to worry about that ourselves. So even though, the, again, the cost per mileage may be more expensive, and even when you consider the total mileage that we have to travel, um, the fact that we don't have to pay for those extra, uh, additional expertise uh, uh, you know, straight away also means that it can work out cheaper on the total cost of ownership side of things. And also the fact that uh, we can just uh, get in the cab and just get where we uh, we need to go rather than thinking about, okay, uh, maybe maybe I don't know where you are based uh, and uh, you know, over here, uh, it's probably not so bad, but I know, in, you know for people that are listening in the US or Canada, sometimes it gets really cold. So you can't just get in your car and uh, drive away and go where you want to go. You have to wait for the the whole the whole the whole car to uh, to uh, to to come back to life because all the you know, the engine is is you know, so cold the engine is dead you have to scrape the eyes off your windows and all these things um, there are things that you have to do um, because you have to you know you're responsible for that again for that car uh, and again you know when you're just using an Uber you just get in the car that's it you drive away and get to where you need to go so that translates to agility for the business so instead of um, you know, every time someone needs to do something or work with, uh, um, deal with a different workload that they haven't done today, they have to now, okay, um, you know, create a lot of, another set of machine images, container images, and every time they do something, they need to register um, a new, a new, uh, new, um, uh, a new version of their of their of their uh, of the say Docker image, and then that they have to do with VPCs and everything else that comes with uh, working with the uh, containers. They're just more things you got to fiddle and t and tinker and deal with, and uh, rather than just focusing on writing those couple of lines of code that's important to your business. So again, in terms of getting things done as a business, you allow allows you to. By, by dedicating more responsibility to the cloud provider, it allows your team to do more uh, with less effort and time, uh, which just means that from a different angle of looking at cost, uh, uh, it means that you have less, or there's less opportunity cost for you because you're able to, for example, I mean, I have helped clients to launch entire social, a whole new social network in a couple of weeks because again, I can just focus on what, you know, what they need for their application and uh, use uh, all the serverless components where I don't have to worry about machines and uh, configuring them, securing them and all of that because they come in, you know, scalable by default, resilient, but you know, redundant with um, redundant infrastructure by default. They got, uh, you know, uh, secure uh, and uh, then they're scalable and secure by default as well. So, you know, I can just get things done much more quickly uh, with less resources. In fact, I can probably do more now with my, myself working part time than I could uh, say, uh, say 10 years ago, where I have to do all of these other things uh, with a whole team of people to look after all of these environments, machines and, uh, and security groups and all this networking stuff. So for my business uh, is, I guess, as, as the business, everything comes down to uh, cost and return on investment. And the server just means that you can get things more um, done more quickly, which means uh, uh, less opportunity cost, uh, but also needing fewer people or have the people that you have already allow them to do more. Um, so again, that all comes back down to uh, uh, you know, being able to have a higher return on your investment. So you're basically saying, let's say like go to market is becomes much more faster. Yeah. That's right. Faster go to market, uh, cheaper total cost of ownership, um, and um, more agility to be able to say pivot and to try something different uh, again because it takes less time to do the same amount of work. Oh, sorry, less so time to get the same amount of output. If can you break down to me, let's say like the key components of a typical serverless architecture on and how each service interact with each other. Let's say like I'm someone who's getting into serverless. 
I want to understand how does this thing work? Yeah, so it kind of depends uh, on what it is that you're building. Um, you know, you, um, I guess most people are building some kind of APIs um, and uh, maybe they have some elements of uh, event-driven architecture. Um, so for APIs, you have, say, API Gateway, um, and then you have Lambda functions, and then you have DynamDB. So, you know, DynamDB is your database, um, NoSQL database, uh, which, you know, is not right for absolutely everything, uh, but for most of the use cases, uh, it's probably, you know, we have, it's probably good enough uh, because it's very heavy on, you know, get, you know CRUD uh, based on some key, that, uh, some ID that we need to ask some data. Uh, and then Lambda allows us to write custom code, uh, whatever you know business logic we have um, to execute them. And then the API gateway is just uh, provides the um, I guess reverse proxy layer where you know you, you have this API endpoint that allows some, someone to call your API. Um, but sometimes you need to also, you know, have uh, different services that work together by, say, loose in, in a way that's loosely coupled, so that uh, uh, my service uh, that allows you to say place an order, so it may just fire an event um, once the order has been so sort of recorded that uh, hey, there's an order, there's a new order. And then some other promotion service who may listen to that uh, event by subscribing to the event um, in the event bridge. And, uh, and event bridge is our you know, event bus uh, where all the events from the system is going in there and everyone can subscribe to the different events that it is interested in. So in this case, say someone building a promotion service that uh, um, gives out um, uh, the discount codes uh, on your first or tenth order, they can listen to that event uh, that, hey, um, Yen just placed a new order. Uh, let's check uh, how many orders he's had. Okay, this is his first order. Okay, great. Let's send him an email with uh, some promotion code for his next or uh, for his uh, next order and so on. So uh, this allows you to build, uh, build systems in a way that uh, you can have lots of uh, loosely coupled services uh, um, that are loosely coupled through shared contracts or events as opposed to more sort of tight the coupling between uh, different services through AP, uh, synchronous API calls. And also, I want to move towards the coupon example. If I'm using serverless, okay. if let's say I want to check Jan, if he ordered and he going to send him a coupon, but the thing is, is that you have a scale of, let's say, not one client, you have tens, tens or thousands of clients. Mm -hmm. If you have, let's say, a monolithic application, you might not be able to track this person because the server might have too much workload on it to be able to send them the coupon. Whereas in serverless, I don't have to worry about this because each instance handles its own. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Uh, I wouldn't say that uh, you, you wouldn't be able to do that with a uh, monolith, uh, monolithic application. Uh, you absolutely can. I mean, the, um, uh, maybe the specific example you're having, you're having the, uh, wouldn't be that uh, you can't ha you can't do it, but maybe there's a performance impact because uh, when you're running, you know, when you have a, more monolithic applications running on, say, containers or on EC2 instances, uh, you know, all of these concurrently processing requests are sharing the same you know, CPU cycles uh, and the same network bandwidth. So you have some constraints so as you get to the point where you're handling more than, say, X number of requests per second um, or concurrently on that same server, then the, you may be CPU saturated or you may be saturating the available network bandwidth. So that's a performance impact. Um, but the bigger problem may be that, okay, you've just uh, unhandled the exception and uh, you didn't you, you didn't think of it, that like you don't have the right error handling all the way up to maybe the top level of your application. Then uh, maybe the bigger problem could be that, okay, when we're trying to look up uh, Yen's order, there's some bug we didn't realize and that blows up and uh, the unhandled exception bubbles all the way to the top and somehow blow up our resource, uh, blow up the whole process, the whole application. Then all the other concurrently executing uh, orders would be, you know, would be would be cancelled. Uh, would be well disrupted. At least uh, there may be some recovery mechanism you have. Um, whereas uh, with you know, lambda and uh, uh, you know, functions. Uh, one of the things about Lambda functions is that uh, it runs one request at a time um, so that uh, you can have uh, many, many concurrently executing um, instance of the same function, but every single inst uh, instance of it is only handling one request at a time, which means that uh, you don't have that resource contention at the sort of CPU and the network bandwidth level. Uh, but also it means that the individual, comp individual requests can fail without having any impact on any other uh, concurrently uh, executing requests. 
So in terms of uh, with uh, resiliency, that's really, really useful, that ability to, you know, having that independent, isolated uh, failures, uh, but also in terms of uh, scalability as well, being able to scale out and um, you know, have a more predictable, I guess, performance in, in, in that sense as you scale to have more and more requests. So I'm going to move to where it's a different question, which is by the time we start seeing companies offering frameworks to help you develop on the cloud in a serverless manner, can you talk about how some of these frameworks help in the development experience and working together as a team? And do you think some of these frameworks might get people to get used to them to the point you get locked into that framework? So let's say that framework might provide you a plugin that makes things easier. You can talk about this in detail yeah, if you want to. Sure. Um, so, I mean, in terms of uh, deployment frameworks, um, uh, no, its, it's main job is uh, to take your application uh, you know, and then the, you know, package it somehow and then the, deploy your application to the cloud. Could be AWS, could be something else. Uh, in a way that's repeatable, in a way that uh, doesn't require uh, you know manual um, actions. Um, uh, but uh, there's also a difference between you know, that just for the deployment side of things. Uh, but uh, you know, for you know, when it comes to a framework, uh, a framework. I guess the difference between a framework and a library is that the library is something that you use. You can choose how to compose them and use them in your own application, whereas a framework detects how you do things and uh, your application fits into, uh, inside that framework of, of, uh, of you know, the way it does things. Um, so we got we have lots of uh, sort of tools in the market. You got the serverless framework, which is you know, a framework. You got AWS SAM or serverless. Uh, application uh, model, which is also a framework, again, because it dictates certain, it makes certain high level decisions about how things are done and your application fits into it. Uh, but then you've got something like things like a CDK or the cloud development kit, which is actually, um, think you can think of more of a li more, more as a library that uh, um, sure it has got some conventions and the constraints, uh, but by and large you have uh, much more flexibility in terms of how you do things. Uh, but it also has the I uh, SST as well, which has got a more of a framework too in that there's certain ways it, it does things. Uh, and then you've got other things, lots of other things like architect, um, uh, and Wenglang and uh, or you can just use CloudFormation or Terraform uh, directly as well. Um, I would say that you know, especially if you're a beginner, um, going with a framework uh, is is really helpful because uh, it, the uh, I well the frameworks like that we have today, like Serverless Framework and Sam, they've been around for a long time. They've had a lot of chances to learn from uh, you know how people are building things and then the give you a lot of uh, good sensible defaults, but also a structure, a way to structure your application that kind of makes sense and works for most people. Uh, and then of course, the uh, framework has got a plugin ecosystem so that uh, you, there's something you want to do that's not natively supported by the framework. You can use a plugin to then extend the, um, the framework's capability. Uh, things like, okay, uh, I'm doing Node.js and I want to use a ES build to bundle my application. How do I do that? If the framework doesn't do it natively, you can bring a plugin to then do that for you. Um, Sam doesn't have that uh, fl uh, that plugin ecosystem, uh, so there's no way for you to do that uh, um, out of the box unless that's something the framework does for you. Um, same goes to CDK. CDK, you know, has got constructs that allows you to do, to to implement the bundling, uh, but then that, that construct makes certain constraints about how it does certain things. Um, so it may be difficult to uh, accommodate some other things that you're doing. Um, kind of drawing a blank on what that may be, but uh, uh, but yeah. So it's. Uh, it's different uh, different tools has got their own kind of um, uh, uh, sort of constraints, and uh, personally, I still very much like the server framework because I feel it gives me the right balance of uh, you know, a having a structure, having that extensibility, uh, well, having the structure and that uh, sort of opinionated the take on how to structure your application. And the great thing about that is that uh, I can go to anyone's uh, project and straight away I can understand, okay. What are your what are your lambda functions? What permissions do you have? Uh, what's you know what are the event triggers for your functions? Um, and uh, because everyone's uh, service YAML is structured the same way, so that consistency is really really useful. Uh, and it's very it's very apparent when you are a consultant that has to work with many different people. Um, whereas if I you know take something like CDK for example. 
there's no opinion about how you structure a CDK application per se in terms of how does how do you specify your lambda functions, how do you how do you organize them into stacks, how do you organize the the stacks into applications. So everyone can do their own thing. And plus, with CDK, you can create your level three constructs yourself, and lots of other things you can do, just kind of do your own thing because you've got a programming language at your disposal. Uh, means that every time I go to a different client that uses CDK, it's a whole new adventure for me. I have to first understand how the CDK app is kind of put together to understand what are the things that are part of this application before I can use that, before I can build up a mental model of, okay, this application has got API, it's got some Lambda functions, it's got some resources, and uh, okay, the permissions are configured here, the event triggers are configured there. So there's just, there's, you know, one, I have to understand one application, which is the CDK application, before I can actually understand the business application. Um, whereas with something like SAM and server framework, because of that framework, uh, so structure that's already in place means that uh, the, you know, doesn't matter where I go, I look at the same YAML uh, or server framework YAML, it's the same structure. So I don't have to understand. I just have to you know, okay, use that to figure out what's the application and then start drilling into the application and what it does. Uh, but yeah, but yeah, there's lots of different tools available now. Um, uh, they have their own, I guess, their different trade-offs, and I'd, li I'd like to think of them on, on, you know, on this axis of uh, how uh, how opinionated they are, how customizable they are, um, and, uh, and and yeah. So uh, no, for me, server framework still has the right balance of the two. And also, the and also, there's one thing: you don't have to write cloud formation, which is a very important point. Yeah, so that's the, probably the, one of the other axes, which is uh, how productive they are. Um, and I find that the productivity, the, the productivity axis is interesting. Uh, obviously, you know, as you go down to something like CloudFormation or Terraform, the base layer, I guess, the provider, um, it's, it's just a lot more things you have to write. Um, whereas, you know, whereas if I've got an API gateway checking a Lambda function, that would be maybe three, four lines of code in the server's YAML. Um, that would translate easily into 100 plus lines of uh, Terraform HCL. Um, uh, and also be also a very high number of uh, cloud formation lines of code as well. So obviously it's not very productive uh, for me to uh, be writing that uh, when I've got you know, an API with maybe 10, 20, 30, whatever, how many, however many different endpoints and Lambda functions. So um, it's not productive for me to be working at that level, uh, that lower level, that very low level of abstraction. Um, so as the as I go higher to, to the higher level of uh, abstraction, of course, there's uh, there's more productivity, but also more constraint in terms of uh, what that abstraction allows you to do, allows you to customize. Uh, and um, for the frameworks like Architect and the Cloudia, uh, which uh, kind of more sort of uh, have got the abs um, abstractions that are more tailored towards specific use cases, and I guess as SST goes into that as well. Um, but it's not, I guess it's not as opinionated in that sense. Um, but yeah, so the frameworks that has got that really high level of abstraction, perhaps it would be much more uh, productive uh, for a specific use case that you have. But at the same time, you run the risk of potentially not being able to use it for a new workflow, a new thing that you want to build. And so potentially you have to then, okay, right, either spend a lot of time fighting the framework to make it do what you want to do, uh, or you have to maybe look at something else. And one of the things that uh, I always thought about uh, you know, when it comes to CDK is that uh, CDK is you know, because of you got you know, the fact that you've got the general purpose language at your disposal makes it very useful for cases where you know, that is actually uh, um, that's, that's, that's an asset, not a, li not, not a liability. Um, in that, for example, if you got the say, uh, I've had clients who's got a build a system. Turns out this that, that system is useful in lots of different. You know, uh, context so they can white label that solution and uh, and so having you know being able to capture the different parts of the application system into uh, constructs which means that they can quite easily mix and match um, different uh, components and maybe create custom components for a specific uh, client uh, and create white label solutions uh, white, white label versions of the application which would be very difficult to customize and do with say confirmation or even server framework um, but CDK gives you that ability and there's also applications you know sometimes those applications are also very very um customizable it depends on different parameters again those kind of uh, customization probably makes it very difficult to do with uh, uh, something other than you know, CDK or, or maybe a winglang um, and then there's also cases where in the large enterprise uh, there's a lot of uh, we talked about some of the security requirements rather than every team having to do you know, 
the same thing, but to have to work out how to do it, you can create the level three constructs to, to basically encapsulate a lot of those requirements and uh, share with the rest of the company so that the, everyone can just use those uh, you know, high level constructs, uh, even though they often don't translate across organization lines very well. Um, so CDK is, is very good in some context, uh, but at the same time, um, for a lot of people that are building the you know, simpler things that doesn't require that you know, the high level of customization, um, the, the fact that you've got a general purpose language means that uh, it's more of a liability because you have to make more decisions about how to structure your CDK application and you make choices that you, know, you probably uh, are not best suited to make those decisions. And I've seen, you know, I've seen lots of people do uh, things in CDK that shoot themselves in the foot. Um, but the thing is, people don't choose frameworks for projects, they choose frameworks uh, for themselves. And so they end up using the same framework for lots of different kind of workloads regard and situations, regardless whether or not it's the right one for that situation. And because most people don't have the same kind of exposure that I have of working across multiple you know, customers and see some of the problems that comes up only when you look at things in aggregate, um, that you know, they probably don't realize that the problem that they're, they're gonna face later on uh, as, they, as the organization grows or as they start to uh, take on other workloads. Um, so in a way, I guess that kind of links to your other previous question about uh, does that uh, makes you locked into that uh, framework? Um, uh, but yeah, yeah potentially, um, that's, I guess, no, it's never truly locked in per se because you can always just oh, rewrite the whole thing with a different framework. Um, but you know, in terms of uh, the, 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 the convenience and, and the comfort and the skills and experience that you've built up. So there's definitely going to be a lot of friction for people moving from one framework to another uh, because you have, you know, you're invested into using that framework and uh, it, it sometimes can be difficult to pull them, uh, to pull it out. Uh, and especially when you've got uh, things like uh, if you're moving from um, SST, for example, recently moved from uh, CloudFormation to um, uh, from CDK to Pulumi, uh, and that is a that is a big change. So, as a user of, C of, of SST, you have to you, you have no choice but to just uh, you know, redo your whole thing because uh, you can't just uh, pull everything over to, from um, CDK to Pulumi. So, um, there's also that risk as well in terms of uh, uh, you know, having you know, using. Uh, having the, uh, dependencies on that uh, on a particular deployment framework. And also, I want to give some points about this. So, let's say for an example, in SSD, I can deploy a Next.js application using their own Open Next. Uh, yeah. I want to say plugin or a system. But the thing is, if I want to move to a different framework, I'm unable to do this. The reason why is because I get locked to what SSD has to provide, or I have to redeploy it in a different way, which might not give me the same thing as SST. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, if the the framework you're using has got some unique um, capabilities, then the, yeah, you are quite dependent on that because if you to if you were to move to something else, then you have to basically provide the capability yourself. Yeah, I'm gonna to move towards a different question, which is in terms of security, what is the unique considerations does serverless architecture bring, and how can organizations mitigate potential risks? Um. In terms of unique, uh, I'm not sure about it being unique, uh, but certainly with uh, you know when it comes to serverless architectures, um, you know using services that are things like uh, API Gateway, Lambda, and DynamoDB, um, those services um, already eliminate entire entire attack vector, well, uh, well in entire class of uh, attack vectors uh, because. The underlying EC2 instances and underlying servers are managed and, you know, and secured by AWS, and, and so you know someone can't just uh, log on to your to the virtual machine that's running your Lambda function and start doing bad things there and uh, intercept your requests and uh, run the uh, you know crypto jacking and things like that. Um, so they actually are much more secure because again. Um, there are less things that you have to secure yourself. Um, so AWS has got this thing called the shared responsibility model that says uh, which part of the entire stack uh, is uh, responsible, you know, AWS is responsible for uh, for uh, securing and which ones are, are yours. With a serverless, uh, you know, there's more more things that go into uh, to AWS uh, side of uh, of the court um, than it is on yours. So you know, serverless uh, means your application is much more secure. In terms of um, anything that's uh, security-wise, anything unique to serverless, um, there's probably more of an emphasis uh, um, on understanding the 
Uh, maybe that's a good one to talk about. Um, denial of service attacks um, is often called the denial of wallet attack um, in the serverless environment because, uh, well, chances are um, you can brute force your way through a denial of service attack because the Lambda and API gateway and all these services are so scalable, uh, but they also charge based on per request, which means, um, you know, when you have a big spike of requests coming from a uh, from a DDoS attack, um, you're going to pay for every single request. So in terms of uh, maybe a, a unique vector in that, uh, okay, instead of having a denial service problem, you have a denial wallet uh, problem instead. And so that's probably more emphasis on thinking about um, uh, putting in place those kind of uh, quote, uh, um, well, super quotas uh, on the API gateway level uh, and having WAF in place so that uh, you you have some kind of rate limiting on the individual caller IP address uh, and uh, you know, proactively block uh, malicious looking IP addresses. So there's probably more emphasis on that because again, uh, you know, some of the cost uh, from one of these uh, denial service attacks uh, can spiral more quickly. Um, that's probably something that's a more maybe more unique uh, to the sort of the, uh, to a serverless environment. Move also to a different question, which is what are the most significant challenges or limitations of serverless computing, and how can they be addressed? So, for an example, with the DDoS problem, is that when I'm going to use the DDoS example, when you have a DDoS attack doing on a Lambda function, the only thing that is not stopping it is because it's scalable and it's going to move all the time. Whereas on a server, it might stop, and that's it where this might be a limit, let's say, if I have too much requests, it won't stop. Is that correct? Uh, it's, okay, even if you're running servers, uh, you, and, uh, no, you should be having, you should have uh, auto-scaling in place, um, it will still impact you, you will still bring up more and more servers. So it's not like, uh, you know, you, you, know uh, you can't suffer from a denial of wallet attacks uh, against a, a server for environment. Um, but those servers comes online much more gradually, and uh, what you're going to see is that you're going to have more of a denial service problem because there's like there's suddenly a big spike of traffic coming into your system. Uh, you don't have enough capacity to handle all of that, which means that legitimate users' requests will also going to get slower and slower and slower because your CPUs are saturated. So that's why you have a denial service problem whereby your service can't serve the user legitimate user requests because of all of these additional requests that come in uh, from the attacker. Um, you still have a problem with, with cost. Uh, it just, you know, that cost is not going to suddenly go up uh, like this because that's the traffic pattern that comes in. But it probably go, probably go up more like this, uh, much, much, more, much more gradually because you can handle multiple requests on the same server. In fact, uh, you, know, you, you end up choosing the now service problem rather than the denial wallet problem. So it's, uh, it's, it's one of the other. Um, and with Lambda, the problem is that you can scale very, very quickly, so you can brute force your way through a denial service attack, uh, but you do end up paying for them as well. Um, that, that's not to say that there's, there's no ways for you to stop that. Uh, you can. Uh, it just means that you, know, you, can, uh, you can set up, a, a, you can, you can um, API Gateway has got a throughput uh, a limit you can set uh, for your API or for individual endpoints. Uh, you can do the same thing with a Lambda function. You can, uh, when you realize that there's a problem, you can set the reserve concurrency on the function um, to maybe even zero to basically say, okay, it's going to stop working. Um, but much better to then, to, in that case, uh, to have those limits in place already before you get into that situation where you realize there's a problem because. Uh, um, Whenever the, you know, the, when that problem is happening, those those uh, costs are already accumulating because every single request you handle is being is, you know you're gonna be you're gonna get charged for that. So much better to be much to be proactive and uh, when you deploy your API, think about what's a reasonable upper throughput limit uh, for the API and for individual endpoints as well, uh, because the default limit on API gateway is uh, fairly high and uh, uh, every single endpoint gets essentially the 10,000 requests per second, uh, which is the available default uh, limit for the entire region. So, um, so yeah, it's uh, something that you should be doing more proactively rather than the reactively. Uh, but that, and that's that's one of the things that we cover in the workshop as well um, to look at those uh, to, those those settings and uh, uh, and uh, understand uh, what's the impact on those uh, on your applications the cost as well as the scalability. I'm going to move to a different question, which is where are some examples of a project or a problem that you've solved using serverless only? Then that when solving this problem or developing this project, that serverless was the right choice for it? 
Uh, yeah, sure. So, I mean, one example could be um, uh, one of one, this, this client helper thing I mentioned to you earlier, where we built a whole new social network in a couple of weeks, and that was that entire stack was uh, fully serverless, uh, now absent on the API, so gateway side of things. So, we use GraphQL, uh, and uh, we have a Lambda function behind it, but most of the absent resolvers actually just talk to DynamDB directly um, because, uh, you know, not have lambda should be if you don't need a lambda function you shouldn't use it uh, you know it doesn't have to be there if you are using something like api gateway or appsing or step function that can integrate directly with the database and you, you're not you don't have to write any custom business logic in between then the, just let the services talk to the other service that directly is cheaper faster more scalable and uh, uh, and um, and yeah it's also easier as well one less things for you to configure and the, the deploy and all of that um and yeah, so the, uh, um, that stack is, uh, the application stack is fairly simple. Um, lots of different, uh, you know, uh, app sync, uh, uh, graph care operations. Of course, it's a social network, lots of things you can do. But, uh, you, know, I, you know, in terms of architecture, the different moving parts, uh, it's mostly just app sync, uh, Lambda, and Dynam DB. Uh, we do have a search as well. Uh, for that, we use Algolia, which is a very nice uh, um, service you can use. And it does give you a, more of a serverless uh, sort of pricing model in that uh, you pay for uh, your actual usage uh, in, in sort of units of uh, I think thousand requests per uh, thousand requests so it's search requests or number of rec records you have um, so it's a fairly granular sort of um, uh, um, uh, I uh, guess the you know, usage unit, uh, not per request, of course. Uh, well, which unfortunate, but uh, uh, much better than paying for uptime for some uh, for some you know, uh, search cluster. Um, but the Algolia doesn't uh, doesn't offer uh, encryption or REST. Uh, luckily for this project, we didn't need it. But for another client uh, project where it was in the HIPAA compliance, uh, well, within the HIPAA compliance, so we had to use Open Search uh, so that we can get the encryption or REST. Um, and anyway, so so that's one example, and uh, we used uh, lots of other services around that. Uh, you know, CloudFront, S3, EventBridge for events. Uh, uh, you know, for the event-driven side of thing of the application. Um, and uh, you know, uh, we used the AWS organizations, um, uh, service control policies, uh, and lots of other things. But everything is uh, serverless. I didn't have to manage and run any servers in the whole application, and it's a full you know, social network. They've been going on for a few years now. I helped them build the initial version, and then the, handed it over to someone else uh, to so continue working on that with the, uh, for the client. Uh, but as far as I know, they, I think they're still fully serverless today. So. Yeah, that's, uh, and I've done several projects, uh, you know, fairly complex uh, applications that uh, without having to run any servers apart from maybe open search. Open search is the kind of the the one that uh, right now, apart from uh, from Algolia, uh, there's not too many viable options. That's one of the sort of areas that we don't really have a good this uh, fully serverless uh, option, even though open search serverless exists. Uh, but it's, uh, it's one of the sort of false uh, serverless uh, offerings because uh, you're not you're paying for uptime uh, fairly high cost as well. If you run open source serverless, uh, the minimum cost is about seven hundred um, dollars per month. Um, no, even though it's uh, you know it's based on uh, um, it some kind of compute unit, but you have to have a uh, four units uh, at minimum. So there's no scaling to zero, uh, and it's not really you know, usage based pricing. And uh, so yeah, AWS has been guilty of uh, diluting the definition of a serverless by publishing a few of these uh, false serverless uh, offerings uh, the last couple of years. Uh, Neptune serverless is another one, but uh, I think uh, open source serverless is probably the most um, egregious uh, example because of the high monthly cost with no. At, 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 at a baseline, at the sort of minimum cost. Uh, I think I saw a lot of tweets about open search serverless in terms like <laughs> this is where the term like serverless is more like better managed than actually serverless. This is where it started getting into it. When when people start seeing open source serverless, you still have to pay for four instance units. I remember. That's Come right. On. Yeah, four uh, four units, not instance. Uh, for uh, some, I think it's kind of the, uh, some compute unit. Um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, you have to have four units at a minimum. Yeah, and you you're locked with them even on the serverless. So it's better off to use the servered regular version than to use the serverless one. Yeah, that's Alice. Well, I mean, the may for most people, I would say so. Uh, but if uh, you really don't you know, if you if if cost is not your main concern, it's but more expertise and uh, skill, which is the case for a lot of uh, large enterprise customers I work with, uh, where 
you know, they've got lots of money, uh, but they can't hire the right expertise because no one really wants to work for them because they're seen as uh, these uh, legacy companies. Uh, they're not one of the fancy new tech startups and whatnot. So they often find it's very difficult to hire the right expertise. So uh, in the absence of that, maybe open source serverless uh, is something that uh, you know, makes sense for them because uh, they're more concerned about the you know, product velocity and um, uh, uh, and you know, being able to get something done done, done well, then you know, for me for them, seven hundred dollars a month is is, is nothing. Is uh, is less than when you pay one of your contractors to work on a project. So, so um, in most situations, I'll say you know, server, open source serverless is uh, not worth the while. But that's not that's not to say that again, uh, there are situations where it probably does make sense. And also, we're starting to see, let's say, companies ditching serverless in favor of, let's say, hosting their own infrastructure as a monolithic application for multiple reasons. I want to give a good notable example, which is the Prime Video switch to monolithic, which helps them to save costs. Would you like to give your input on this? Yeah, sure. Um, if you actually read the Prime Video article, um, is it? I think a lot of people, what happened is that a lot of people read the article with tinted glasses and uh, straight away the reaction is uh, Amazon is ditching serverless uh, for server, uh, a server for architecture. Um, but if you actually read that, if you actually read the article, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's actually a really good example of evolutionary architecture, which is your architecture should always be evolving to meet your context because you know, your business, your, your application changes over time. Um, and... Um, First thing I want to say is that uh, it's not Amazon ditching. It's not Amazon ditching a serverless per se. It's one team within a one business area of a, one of the largest organizations in the world uh, for one of their services decided to switch from step functions to uh, run into to implementing all the workflows inside containers. Uh, and they actually talk about this in the article that initially they decided to go with uh, serverless, Lambda, and all of these things because um, they're building a new thing. They don't know if anyone's want to use it. It's an internal tool. Um, so, you know, that was a couple of years ago. They just kind of do this thing. They want to have a, a quick time to market. So they build it with uh, things that are going to give them the most uh, heavy lifting so that they can do less uh, to get something out. Again, talk about that uh, time to market we talked about earlier, right? So... They did that. Um, turns out it's a useful tool and a lot of people want to use it. And uh, several years later, they have a lot of throughput. There's a lot of people using, uh, using the, this, this uh, service internally to, um, to Prime Video. And so the costs start to mount up. Um, and because it's been a few years, they have kind of learned uh, the application, what people want uh, to use it for. So they also don't need to sort of drastically change and pivot the features uh, on a regular basis. So they don't need some of the agility that comes with using serverless and being able to add new capabilities uh, really easily. And so it makes sense at that point to think about, okay, now that we don't need all that agility to you know, quickly pivot things and change things and add new capabilities, how can we run this thing more efficiently, especially now that we know the traffic pattern is fairly stable and also mm -hmm. fairly su uh, substantial. So at that point, okay, What's the most reasonable thing we can do to um, uh, to, to sort of save on, on to make our system more cost efficient? Okay, let's move from step functions and move our, our, our orchestration into uh, into uh, uh, containers instead. So that obviously makes sense, right? Your 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 business context evolved. You no longer uh, are discovering your market fit. You no longer are sort of uh, adding new things constantly. And, uh, instead, and your traffic is very high now and also fairly predictable. So let's move to a different technology that's more suitable for that, more cost efficient for that. But they also talk about something that's very important, which is they didn't have to rewrite the entire application because they had good modularity in their code in the first place. So they were able to take pretty much what they had originally, uh, replacing the, some of the orchestration layer from step functions into maybe a different framework for orchestration. But most of the business logic um, that they had they were running in the Lambda functions were the same uh, as they moved to the containerized environment, which again, kind of uh, kind of demit, kind of um, destroy the myth of, uh, of vendor lock-in with, uh, with uh, Lambda and serverless, right? That uh, if this, uh, this, uh, this team uh, within, eight, uh, you know, within Prime Video is able to move the entire system for this uh, no, video, I, I don't know what, I forgot what it does. Is it the video labeling or something like that, analysis or something like that? Um, this entire system from serverless to, uh, to containers in a matter of uh, weeks um, and uh, without having to rewrite entire application, though, you know, where's the lock-in? Um, so that's again something that people didn't you know 
talk about, but it was right there in the article. Uh, and so if you actually read the article without the tinted glasses, it's, uh, again, it's a good example of um, evolution architecture. And uh, you know, myself and most other people that advocate for serverless, uh, we always say you want to go serverless first. So you start with serverless until it doesn't make sense anymore. We never say you should always use serverless uh, because no technology choice is going to be right for every single situation. That's just, you know, it's silly to assume that, that there is such a thing. Um, um, and, uh, and 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 yeah, so um, there's uh, you know, there's no, there's there's nothing wrong with what it did. What it did is what I would do as well, uh, and is what everyone should be doing uh, if the context has changed over time and that uh, the initial technology choice no longer makes sense. They should evolve and pivot and change. Yeah, I've uh, I've interviewed lots of companies who's gone the other way as well, going from Kubernetes to to uh, to, to serverless because they realize uh, you know that the initial decision they had uh, doesn't really add, give them the, the the um well all the value, but they're carrying all the burden of the total higher cost total um, higher total cost of ownership and the slower ability to iterate and and new capabilities uh, over time. So they moved to serverless. I've spoken with quite a few other companies who've done that, and a few clients in the financial services sector that has jump all the way from uh, on uh, on prem to serverless because uh, they realize they don't have a skill set to run uh, containers uh, in a way that's uh, safe efficient and um, and um, and scalable and so they go straight to serverless to get the you know, all the benefits that serverless offers you offers you in those regards yeah but there are certain individuals who let's say start recommending going towards hosting your application in <laughs> your own hardware on a VPC rather than just starting with serverless and moving forward. So I'm going to give, let's say, a notable example of this is 37 Signals with the recent shift. Mm -hmm. And they have a new strategy called Once, if you've heard about it. So what they did is that I'll give an example, which is a very decent example what they did, but using that example doesn't fit for everything. So what 37 Signals did with Once, they created something called Campfire, and it's an alternative to Slack. But the thing is, is that you run it on your server and you have, let's say, Slack-like Slack -like capabilities. The thing that's good about this is that Slack is kind of expensive as your team gets bigger versus hosting your own chat system that works and you pay for one price, which makes sense. But the thing is, is that if this works, this doesn't mean I have to, every single application that I have, to take it off, put it on a VPC and manage everything. So I want your thoughts on this. Yeah, and sure. Um, I used to work for um, companies of which where we have uh, internal teams that manage a lot of these management systems. Um, people you know, people think, you know, okay, maybe Slack is expensive, but uh, they, they, they're probably not thinking about the four people they have to hire to manage the system over time and the salary they're going to be paying for those people. Um, so again, for some situations, uh, maybe, it's, uh, yeah, maybe it will end up cheaper. Um, but for a lot of companies, uh, Probably not, because uh, you have to have people that uh, need that knows how to run this uh, software that uh, you're running on your uh, in your environment. Um, uh, but also, I guess uh, going back to the the the, the 30, um, 37 signals example, um, Slack is a, a messaging systems is one of the very first use cases of the internet, right? So it's not exactly a um, Something. If you look at the, I don't know if you have heard of, uh, you have heard of uh, uh, Wadley Maps. Uh, Simon Wadley creates the uh, Wadley Mapping, which uh, sort of plots the evolution of, uh, say, a technology on the axis that starts from Genesis. So you know it's a new thing. You are still discovering uh, essentially the, what you should be building and uh, what people actually want. And then the, all the way to the other end, you have commodities where the requirements are well understood. Um, there's maybe even some standards that governs the uh, communication protocols and whatnot. So as you go towards, uh, so to the right, the, the, the commodity side of things, uh, well, there's less need for quickly changing and adding new capabilities because everyone kind of knows what a messaging service needs to do, right? Needs to be able to send messages and to upload files and whatnot. Um, Whereas if you're building, say, a new social network catering for a different sub niche, uh, maybe you, you know you have no idea what it is that you're going to need to add to your system tomorrow. So you need that ability to quickly be able to add new capabilities, and that's where you know, cloud will be really good. And if you look at other products from 37 Signals, um, they also do email and calendar. Wait, those are also one of the first use cases of the internet. Uh, so exactly not exactly groundbreaking in terms of, uh, okay, what capabilities you need to be able to provide in terms of, uh, from a product point of view. Um, 
and uh, and and yeah, for them, uh, it makes sense for them to you know to 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 you know look for things that are the most cost efficient to run and to run everything in their own data centers. Uh, especially when you consider that they already have the expertise in house to run uh, data centers from I think Basecamp. Um, so because they have the expertise already to run the um, to run the data center, which most other companies uh, who are listening to him and going uh, you know, cloud repatriation uh, probably don't have the expertise and they now have to hire someone else to do it. And uh, every couple of years, they're going to find that, that there's going to be extra costs involved with uh, replacing those hardware. Um, and it's not going to be as easy to uh, to add the new capabilities uh, uh, because they want to say bring in some new AI capabilities. Uh, now they have to have think about okay, do we need different hardware? Do how do we get a new service that make it easy for us to run say the new cloud uh, cloud three? Whereas uh, someone running on the cloud would just be able to say okay, let's just use uh, AWS a Bedrock and that can give us a provider to work with. Well, these different uh, fund, uh, foundational models um, and so you know cloud is great if you need that um, agility to be. Able to quickly add new capabilities and scale. And um, I worked in the, you know, when I was working in the banking, uh, we had our own data centers. Uh, we had, uh, you know, Credit Suisse back then was a very, actually very good at building data centers. Uh, but um, yeah, you know, you, you know, what, know what was difficult? It was uh, adding new things, new capabilities, and getting new uh, hardware into our data centers. Uh, you know, the, 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 the pace of your illusion and uh, was, was very, very slow. And that's where, you know, cloud is going to give you much more agility and adding new things quickly and evolving your product and so when you are on that left uh, left side of the wildly maps uh, x axis of uh, building something that's new uh, a new product and that's still evolving the cloud is absolutely a great fit for that and when adopting to the cloud one of the most important things is to build resilient application which involves about testing the application that i have Testing serverless mm -hmm. applications can be a bit cumbersome due to the fact that architecting serverless application can involve using different services and different ways of engagement between these services. One notable pattern, which is the test honeycomb, which is a different paradigm than the typical test pyramid that we go through. Would you like to talk more about this and elaborate further? Yeah, sure. I mean, testing serverless applications is not as hard as you think. Uh, and the uh, test honeycomb is a... Pro it's a way to look at testing, um, whereby um, you know the, the, the test pyramid tells us that we should have a lot more unit tests um, that test our code mod uh, code modules, and we have few integration tests that test our code against uh, um, other things that uh, we don't control, other components we don't control, and then you have even few end to end tests that test the whole system from end to end. Um, so that's the the test pyramid. Uh, test honeycomb looks at this. Uh, you know, it starts from the I guess the micro the, the, the era of microservices, and I think the um, the Spotify was the, the blog was the first place I've, I've seen it mentioned is uh, you think, okay, as we move to microservices, um, there's, few responsi there's fewer responsibilities in our code. So we should have fewer uh, unit tests because they don't have as much value, but we should have more integration tests because there's more of the things are being done. Capabilities are being uh, achieved by having different services integrate with each other, maybe calling different uh, services. And then we have a fewer end-to-end tests at the top. So we have a big chunk of integration tests in the middle and we have fewer end-to-end um, -end tests because end-to-end -end tests again they are slower to execute and so uh, there's a, a slower feedback loop and therefore um, uh, you know, developers prefer, still want to have for that fast feedback loop and therefore we focus more on the integration test layer and the uh, unit test you know, also somewhat as well depending on how complex of a business domain you have for that particular service so that is not a specific thing for serverless but I think that model works really well when you have a serverless architecture because uh, many serverless architectures involve uh, lots of different components lots of different services and so having uh, and again because you're dedicating more and more responsibility to the cloud for example, for my you know, for building a REST API, I wouldn't be writing that authentication logic and the authentication and authorization logic in my code. I would be dedicating that to API Gateway and to integrate that with a Cognito. So there are fewer things in my code, and therefore there's less value on um, return on investment for my unit test. So I have fewer of those. Uh, but my co whatever whatever code I do have, they tend to have to integrate with other services like calling DynamDB or Stripe or whatever APIs, getting some data back, do some doing some transformations, and then maybe returning it, and then the, maybe sending an event to something something else. So there's much more of that integration layer is where things tend to go wrong, and therefore I should have more tests to cover those integrations with different services. Um, 
And I'll still have end-to-end -end test at the top to have, uh, uh, which is going to give me a uh, list. I want to use those to cover the happy paths to make sure that the, uh, any things that, are, uh, that, you know, that my system is doing is, you know, we, sh we, we, we can test everything all the way through so that if there's any uh, permission-related problems uh, uh, between different services, uh, you know, Lambda function missing permission to talk to DynamoDB or EventBridge not having the permission to, to invoke, uh, to send a message to SNS or whatever, um, I want to make sure that those are identified before it goes to to, to production, and so I still have end-to-end -end test to cover uh, you know the, the, the entire flow of the system. Um, so that's just how we kind of organize our tests and where we sort of focus around testing, uh, but not not actually how you write your tests. Uh, in terms of how you write your tests, uh, you know, there's different ways to approach that as well. You, you know, for we, we just, okay, for the most of the things that okay. I guess the two sides of it. One side, of, one sort of category to think about is uh, in terms of what you want to test is uh, the code that you have, the code you're writing and running inside Lambda functions, for example. The other half of it is uh, all the things that we are delegating to other services and asking uh, asking them to do. So things like uh, having API gateways talking to DynamDB or AppSync talking to DynamDB or EventBridge to forward a message to SNS, whatever it is, those are not code per se because we're not writing the actual you know, code that, uh, that takes an event and writing is something else. We are configuring a service to do that uh, that behavior, but that is still part of our application and something that we should test. And so for those things that uh, we are dedicating services to do, we can use the entrance test to do those. Um, to exercise those 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 paths to make sure that they're working, uh, and the, for the code that we actually own and run in our Lambda functions, uh, if you know if we have got a lot of uh, uh, business uh, logic, then we can write unit tests for them. Still, there's nothing changed there. Um, but what about if we just you know most of my functions are not very heavy on the business logic side of things? Uh, what well, if I just want to test my Lambda function handler? Maybe this well, I'll still have some. Um, sort of lightweight high cycle and architecture type of thing going on where uh, it's lots of the, the business logic for writing and uh, saving an order or um, deleting an order or whatever. Those are writing to DynamDB, of course, but I'll encapsulate them into a module so that the different functions in the same API can reuse the same logic. Um, but my hand of the code would have uh, some more the, just the orchestration bits to say, okay, save an order, do this, and then uh, return a response to the API gateway. So I want to just exercise my function and, okay, how do I do that? Um, the, the, there's different ways to do that. Uh, you could just write them as unit tests and they use mocks. So Martin Fowler calls this uh, um, uh, isolated uh, tests where you only test one component at a time. Uh, but a problem I find with uh, using mocks and stops for those cases is that, okay, oftentimes the only thing that, uh, that that's worth testing is that call to DynamDB, uh, but you're mocking that out. So there's any problems with, say, the way you configure your request, um, well, you're not going to find it until much later. So even though you have a fast feedback loop, if that feedback, that's only useful if that feedback loop is giving you accurate information um, in the same way that uh, AI give you fast answers, but if it just gives you hallucinations all the time, then it's not very useful, right? And so you want your test to have that fast feedback loop, but also give you actual accurate and meaningful answers. And so the way I kind of prefer to write those kind of tests is to instead what I call remote code testing, whereby I execute the Lambda function code locally, but have them talk to remote services like DynamDB. And so this way I still get the value of a local testing whereby I can put breakpoints, I can uh, make code changes and test them without having to wait for a deployment cycle. Uh, but I get the sort of value of a remote testing uh, because my function code is talking to remote services of course, this approach only works for testing your code, not the configuration you have for your services. For your Lambda function code, uh, you can absolutely get a fast feedback loop by being able to test them locally um, and having them talk to the real services. So you get to kind of get the best of both worlds. And this uh, approach works really well with uh, using ephemeral environments because, uh, well, before I can run my tests uh, for my Lambda function, I do need that DynamoDB table in the cloud. So when I'm working on a feature, I can create a new temporary environment that has my entire stack, including all the databases for my services and whatnot. Uh, and so I can run tests against that temporary environment uh, as part of a working on a new feature, which means uh, I'm adding a new Lambda function or changing some business logic. I can access, I can iterate and test and all locally. Uh, so giving me a fast feedback loop and when I'm ready, 
Then I commit and then uh, I also write end to end tests as well to make sure that the, the new end to end path uh, is actually working. And, but you know, while I'm iterating on the code to change, um, I don't have to do a deployment every single time. Uh, I, you know, I make a small change just to uh, fix something. And also I can put breakpoints in my code so that I can step through them for things that are more complicated and I can't debug easily by just looking at the logs. Let's say for example, I want to test locally. It works when let's say I'm working with a small team. But when it comes to working with big teams, I still need to raise up a new infrastructure and to work with them. Is that correct? Uh, why? Um, I mean, even when you're working in a, in a large team, uh, ideally you're not all working on the exact same thing. And again, that's where things like a temporary environment is going to be really helpful because even within a small team of two people, if we're both working on the, the same service, but on different features, we're going to want to have you know, our separate environments for each of the work that we're doing. And that's where temporary environment comes in, where I bring up a new stack just for myself uh, that represents my application. And so the thing that I'm working on is... Um, is talking to my stack uh, uh, when your, you know, your 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 changes and your tests are running against your uh, your stack. So we're not uh, we're not uh, stepping on each other's toes. And only when we merge our changes and uh, everything gets deployed to dev, then the, that updates the shared dev environment. And when that gets promoted to the test and staging production environment, those are all shared environments. Uh, but while we're developing a cell on, on our, you know, on our machines and new code changes, we are running against the temporary environments that are short-lived and uh, maybe even specific to one, uh, one CI/CD pipeline run as well. Again, that's something that you can do uh, if you want to avoid the polluting your shared, your main shared environments with test data. You can run CI/CD pipeline with against a temporary environment that is created at the start of the pipeline and destroyed at the end. And other than the fact of testing applications, monitoring serverless applications applications can also be a hassle, unlike monitoring monolithic applications where you expect part of the code <clears> that is taking resources, where it's erroring and stack tracing. Can you recommend, let's say, best practices towards monitoring serverless applications? And if there's any serverless uh, services and tools you recommend utilizing? Uh, I want to also make a distinction between um, uh, uh, you know, serverless doesn't equal microservices and serverless can also be monolithic as well. Uh, in fact, the social network example I gave, that is a monolithic application. Uh, it's, not, it's not monolithic in the sense of one server, uh, but it's monolithic in that it's one application, one repo, one deployment. Uh, it's just that at runtime, that consists of multiple components that are separate to ser resources within AWS, but it's still a monolithic application. And so uh, for the serverless, uh, in terms of actually serv uh, monitoring serverless uh, applications, um, regardless it's microservices or, um, or, or whether you're building microservices or you're building a more monolithic application uh, system because because that is more of a, the way how you structure your system, how you, your, your, your system and the way you carved up the, the boundaries, not so much about the, the number of uh, AWS resources you have um, um, in, your, in, your, in your application. Um, so in terms of monitoring uh, serverless applications, uh, I don't know, one thing is that, uh, okay, uh, to monitor your code, that's the easy part. Um, you know, lots of things can do that. Uh, you know, your Lambda function spits out logs uh, out of the box. It spits out metrics out of the box. Uh, if you're using X-Ray, it also spits out uh, you know, extra traces that they can connect the API gateway to Lambda to whatever. Um, with X-Ray, you've got to do some manual instrumentation to, to get the most of it so that uh, you can see everything that's going on uh, inside your function. So things like Lambda Power Tools from AWS uh, can help with that to some extent, uh, but you're still limited by what the uh, X-Ray is able to do. So personally, I'm a big fan of Lumigo. I mentioned at the start that I work with him quite a lot on content uh, because I'm, I'm a big fan of their service or of, of their products, which makes um, troubleshooting and, uh, and observing what's going on inside your function uh, much, or, much more easily. There's, uh, there's uh, no code integration. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, support for auto instrumentation and uh, by default, they capture the invocation events uh, for your every invocation and as well return value, environment variables, uh, with the sensitive data scrubbed out, uh, as well as every request you make to other API calls, so that request and response. And again, they have a built-in you know, scrubbing so that they don't capture anything that have got like API keys or IDs or anything like that in the attribute name. Um, and so with that, uh, I pretty much don't have to write any custom logs anymore. I don't really use X-Ray anymore. I just use the Lumigo for most of the uh, most of my observability and, uh, and troubleshooting in production. Um, and uh, and I actually find that uh, it works well. A lot it makes it a lot easier compared to even when I have a containerized workload. 
Lumigo supports containers as well, uh, but I don't I don't really run containers myself, so I don't know how well it works over there. Uh, apparently, they also have got a lot of the auto instrumentation going on there as well. Um, but uh, but yeah, I guess a lot of it comes down to you know what tools you decide to use. Um, Datadog is also pretty good as well uh, in terms of uh, some, especially some things that they, they do uh, really well. Things like they have, uh, for analyzing cold starts, uh, they have that whole flame graph thing they can enable. They you can enable, uh, but the, the actual integration with um, with Datadog uh, they require two uh, lambda layers, which has put me into uh, get, got me in trouble a few times because of you know the impact it has on the cold starts, uh, how big the lambda layers are, but also in terms of uh, the fact that it takes up two slots in your five available lambda layers. So for for project that uses a lot of lambda layers, uh, that was a problem. Um, and uh, with Datadog also the, the problem the big the, the bigger problem for Datadog is that it's just really expensive. Um, the, especially if you use the APM package, it's five dollars per function, I believe it still is. Um, so that gets that adds up really, really quickly. And I've had the customers and other people uh, say that, that they have to restructure the, the way they organize the lambda functions because of the cost of Datadog was uh, too high. Um, I've had customers that use Datadog. Um, it's by far probably the, the widest the support in terms of different things they, uh, they they cover. They do a lot of uh, front end observability as well. Um, but uh, but for the stuff that I do, mostly focusing on the back end side of things on AWS, uh, uh, Lumigo has been, uh, and also focusing specifically on serverless. Uh, Lumigo has been the the best option that I've tried, and so I'm still a big fan of the of the of their product. Have you tried Baseline? Uh, I haven't. Got acquired by uh, Cloudflare. Yeah, they got acquired by Cloudflare. Uh, um, they have done a lot of work to support the Cloudflare and things like that. Uh, but I don't use Cloudflare, so uh, no, that hasn't really been something that uh, that I have had to use. I have read, I have seen a lot of things that they push out. Um, it looks interesting, uh, but again, uh, it's not something that I've tried, so I don't want to you know, comment on them. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to move towards a different question, which is: You have a podcast called Reboot Serverless. Would you like to talk more about it? Uh, yeah, it's a podcast where I speak to other people that uh, build uh, uh, serverless applications, uh, mostly for I uh, mostly talk you know, talk to people that uh, build uh, you know consumer facing or business facing products themselves using serverless technologies. Uh, but occasionally, I also talk to you know people that build tools for the serverless community. Recently, I spoke with. Uh, um, uh, Waldemar Hammer, uh, Hammer, who is the CTO of uh, LocalStack, uh, to get a you know, to get a lowdown on what's new in LocalStack v3, uh, and uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's you know it's a place where I talk to other people that are in the serverless space, mostly to people who are using serverless uh, technologies, uh, because I try to avoid having a you know, sales pitch from a vendor, uh, but occasionally I do talk to people who are building tools um, who. Uh, who, are, who who I know are not going to do a sales pitch on my podcast. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to move towards the complete different question, which is what has been the most rewarding aspect of your work and what is something you're proud of? Uh, most rewarding aspect, uh, I guess, uh, maybe is the, the fact that I have worked with lots of different companies, uh, lots of different uh, clients and different situations. So that has been, the, you know, building, that, those, building, building those relationships has been, uh, uh, has been really rewarding uh, and also seeing what other people are doing and, uh, and learning from their experience uh, kind of via, well, by, uh, by proximity. Um, has also been rewarding for me in terms of my own growth. Again, like I said at the start, um, this consulting line of work gives me just much wider perspective in terms of uh, what's going on and um, the different problems people have and the, the solutions that uh, uh, that you may have and also how to apply them to different uh, customer contexts. I always end the podcast with a mental health question. Have you ever faced burnout or imposter syndrome? And if you did, what did you do to resolve these issues? Uh, imposter syndrome, pretty much all the time. I uh, always feel like uh, there's more to learn. There's more um, I don't know. Uh, for example, you asked me about baseline. I haven't used them. I have, and I've, seen, I've seen a lot of the activities that they push on the social media. And now they got acquired by Cloudflare. It kind of makes me even more curious about uh, what they do. Uh, so, yeah, it's, you know, again, you know, lots of things that I want to try, uh, but I haven't. Uh, I, well, I only have 24 hours a day like everybody else. <laughs> so I'm not able to learn and uh, and try everything that I want to. And so you know, the fact that, uh, yeah, that always, always makes you feel, okay, uh, I need to know more and need to learn more. Um, but uh, uh, but luckily, I also you know self-aware enough to know that uh, I don't have to be the smartest. I don't have to know the most. I just have to be, you know, um, uh, just keep doing what I do and keep trying to learn and improve myself. Uh, building it. And uh, I guess, you no, know, it's, it's always good to have the, in the, in the back of your mind, I know, you know we are we're not uh, fully rational beings, but at least uh, it helps to at least ground yourself in the in, in the in the in the knowledge that um, uh, that uh, you know 
you should only compare yourself to your previous self. Uh, don't compare to anybody else um, because that's the only, you know, if you're improving yourself over time, that's, 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 that's good enough. Um, and that's what I try to tell myself all the time to kind of keep my, uh, to keep the, to, to keep the uh, imposter uh, syndrome at, at bay. Uh, in terms of uh, mental health uh, burnout, um, uh, probably, I mean, I've uh, worked some really, really long hours in the past, and I also worked in some difficult, stressful situ uh, situations in the past, and also have been in a, uh, a stressful personal situations more recently as well. Um, but, uh, but I think I've, um, yeah, I, th I think I've mostly been able to stop, well, you know, stay, um, stay away from the the worst aspects of uh, burnout, um, and I've kind of, you know, taken. I guess I've taken care of myself reasonably well. You just, uh, it's, there's no shame of taking a break. There's no wrong. Yeah, that. yeah. There's yeah. times where you just need to take a break and that's it. Yeah, take a break, go on a holiday, go somewhere else to think about something else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Jan, for coming up on the show. I'll mention all of the things that you've done, including some of the courses that you provide. There's also an interesting course about testing serverless applications with Jan provide detailed information about this and also the app sync masterclass that he provides is really good along with the step function course i will give you the fact that i've tried them they're really good and they help me <laughs> in my job so i'll provide them in the show notes below and thank you so much for listening to the episode and i'll see you in the next one thanks guys okay bye-bye